Okay, so for me, I mean, really, <laughs> honestly, this is really quite an opportunity for me. I'm so happy to be able to introduce you to uh, the African Film Festival that's virtual this year. This yep. is the African Film Festival for 2021. And we are, you know, live in February. And um, the your film embodies what we do at the African Film Festival. And it's very important, uh, it's very important to me uh, personally in terms of my own work. So I am glad that we have this opportunity to bring you uh, here live with us virtually from, from Tunis or from Paris? Yeah, no, uh, now I'm in Paris for okay. Okay. medical reasons, but I live in Tunisia. <laughs> Good. Maybe you should, you should uh, uh, tell the audience that Tunisia is located in North Africa, because the name Tunisia, when I came to the state, I said Tunisia, I said, oh, you mean Indonesia. I said, no, no, <laughs> Tunisia is in North Africa, it's not in exactly. Asia. Exactly. <laughs> so first of all, we'll start by, let, let, let me do a brief bio for you, because it's so impressive, and I think it will kind of give a context for how this work came to be and who's behind it. Um, so. What I, you're born in Tunis, which is in North Africa, it borders Algeria, a country that I'm interested in, it's uh, on the Mediterranean. And so Farid Boukdir started his career as one of the most respected film critics in Africa and the Arab world. He's written many articles and books on the history of African cinema, as well as North African and Middle Eastern cinema. He's also directed two full length documentaries, the one that we're doing today, which is uh, Camera d'Afrique and also Camera d'Arab, uh, both presented, both of them have been presented at Cannes. In terms of his educational background, uh, Farid completed two PhD theses on Arab and African cinemas at the Sorbonne in Paris, and he is currently a professor of, of cinema at Tunis University in Tunisia. Uh, Hafween, uh, his critically acclaimed first feature, it's really wonderful, was a box office success internationally, gotten numerous awards in Europe, USA, throughout Arab world, including the Carthage Film Festival's Golden Tani and the Best Arab Film Award at the Cairo International Festival in 1990. In 2013, uh, Hafween was selected at the Abu Dhabi Film Festival as among the best features of Arab cinema. And it remains today a number one box office film in Tunisia ever. His uh, recent film, uh, Zizo and the Arab Spring was awarded best Arab film at the Cairo International Festival in 2016. His second feature, uh, Onate al, al Goulet was selected in official competition at the Berlin Film Festival, awarded the best film at the Biennale uh, de Cinema Arabe, uh, organized by the Arab World Institute in Paris, and best film of North Africa at the 1996 MNET All Africa Film Awards in Johannesburg, South Africa. Farid was a member of the official jury at Cannes in 1991, and again in 2009, and a juror at Berlin Film Festival in 1997, at the Venice Film Festival in 1999, and at the Cairo International Film Festival in 1999. In 2001, he was president of the jury of FESPACO, which is in Ouagadougou, uh, and president of the jury International Arab Film Festival of Iran in Algeria in 2017. He served as vice president and a main organizer of the Pan-African and Pan-Arab Carthage Film Festival and became the director of the festival in 2006. And he also found time to establish the Pan-African and Audiovisual Support Fund, FPCA. Um, in 2013, Bugdia was awarded the important French Légion d'Honneur Medal at Cannes Film Festival. The same year, the Middle East Magazine included Farid as its annual list of the 50 most influential people in the Arab world. And last year- um, I paid them a lot. 
<laughs> yeah, well, they, it, they paid off. They paid off. And so last year, his camera, Dafrique, was remastered in high def and selected for the Cannes Classics 2019. So again, we're uh, we're in, in, in there's high esteem in terms of this guest. And I'd like for you, Fareed, just to tell us in general about this particular film and uh, the impetus for it. Yes, uh, Rico. In fact, uh, I must start from uh, my, my uh, how do we say, uh, training came from what we call the Cine Club, Cinema Houses Club, which is uh, uh, basically a French movement who was very successful after the w World War II and defending the cinema as an art. I mean, uh, defending the author films against the what we call escaping entertainment films. So I was uh, raised in this idea to defend the cinema as an art and the mean of expression, not a way to escape reality uh, in, uh, by seeing Elizabeth Taylor uh, or believing that <laughs> you, you were elsewhere. But the real shock uh, was so I was defending, you know, the great world author like uh, Bergman in Sweden or Buñuel in Spain or uh, uh, this, this, these were the masters for me. But I couldn't even imagine that from our continent could <laughs> emerge yeah. the yeah. equivalent of these masters. I was, I had the inferiority complex, you know. <laughs> and uh, the real salvation and the real shock came in 1966 after I started making short uh, fit, uh, films in Tunisia, and it was uh, the first session of Carthage Film Festival was uh, devoted to African and Arab films. And it was very uh, courageous because at that time there was only one feature from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which was Black Girl by Sam Ben Usman yes. from Senegal, and it won the first prize. Yeah. But by seeing this film, all my conception of cinema was completely overturned. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I said, God, so we may do it too. <laughs> yeah. we may, yeah. In Africa, we may do it and made it in a different and a, a very new way of telling uh, uh, things through cinema. So at the same time, it was the content and the form. Both was, were very new and very courageous and very tough. So from that time, my uh, inferiority complex disappeared. Yes, <laughs> yes. I said, so we can do it <laughs> in Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I went uh, to uh, all the sessions of uh, uh, the Pan-African Film Festival of Ouagadougou in uh, Burkina Faso as a film critic, as you mentioned, there was a film critic of uh, Jeune Afrique, which is a, a, a yeah. weekly newspaper, but the, the most widely spread in uh, French speaking Africa and Francophone Africa. And thanks to this job, I went to all the session of uh, Ouagadougou and of course, all the session of uh, Carthage because it's my country, uh, Carthage. So it was the odd year, it was Ouagadougou and the fair year Carthage, you know, it was, the idea was to cross the Sahara thanks to cinema. So having filmmakers meet one year in North Africa in the, what they call Arab culture dominant region and the other year, the odd year under the Sahara in what we call Black Africa. Uh, and it was a, a bridge between uh, African culture which, which was impossible because of the desert of Sahara before. So yeah. cinema helped us to make a bridge. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, the other turning point for me, which started the idea of making Camera d'Afrique was in FESPACO, in Pan-African Film Festival of Ouagadougou in 1973. Uh, the, the, the festival started being competitive one year before in 1972. And at that time, there was uh, the, the winner was uh, Umaru Ganda from Niger, who was uh, formerly an actor in Jean Rouge film, yeah. uh, Moi un Noir, a, a black man. And he, he became a director himself. But there was no local film in Burkina Faso. Uh, there, was, there was not even TV, you know, the, 
So yeah. in 73, second shock. The second shock is yeah. Yeah. in Pespaco, they were presenting the very first feature film of Burkina Faso called Blood of the Parias. Parias, you know, it is the subcaste system. You know, the, if you belong to uh, a subcaste, you cannot marry with another caste. And, you, you know, the, the injustice of tradition, in fact. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Which, exactly. And yeah. This film was the first film ever made speaking the local language, which is in majority in Burkina Faso, the More. So at that time, there was no roof in the, in the theaters. So we had to wait right. until sundown to, to be able to see films. Yeah. And during the day, we were all, you know, uh, all together in the festival talking about the future African cinema, the struggle, the fight. And uh, uh, for me, it was very important because I was not a foreign observer. I was myself a filmmaker, and there was a real brotherhood between all the regions of Africa represented there, and a huge hope of how to uh, liberate the screens, which were completely dominated by uh, Western films, and put our films on these screens. And so we waited because it was the first time we were going to see a film, a Burkina Bay film. And then it was something I never experienced again in my life because when it became dark and they start the film, yeah. for the first time in history, we heard the Moray language on the screen. And the screen was reserved until then to the Western language, especially French, because even the American film were translated in French. Yeah. And then I'll never forget the incredible reaction of the audience. Yeah. joy, happiness, yeah. you know, pride, yeah. and yeah. Yeah. unique vibration, unique yeah. vibration of completely yeah. uh, filled the theater. Yeah. And I really felt, you know, Rico, that maybe there was some uh, gods at that time, yeah. uh, were good-willing gods, you know, yeah. <laughs> were, were blessing this, yeah. <laughs> this, this uh, screening. Yeah. And really, I felt in my flesh the vital necessity of African cinema at that time. I felt how much it was vital for African people not to be always passive consumers yeah. of other images. How important it was to hear your own language, to see yourself on the screen, to have a mirror, but not a mirror, you know, a, a banal mir mirror. No, a mirror through the point of view of an artist, which is very important. It's not only a photocopy of, of, of reality. Right, exactly. It was a point of view of an artist. And you see yourself and you may discuss with him and you may even not agree with him, but right. you are on the equal level with the, 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 the film, with, with, with the image. You're not, you know, in submission right. with the image of people saying, well, we came to civilize you and you will never reach yeah. <laughs> this level. Yeah. So really, I, I felt in my flesh, I said, I have the luck to be born at a time when this cinema starts. Yeah. I have the unique luck to have met all the pioneers of African cinema, to, to, to fraternize with them, to be like brothers, because we had the same struggle. Yeah. And so my duty before making any feature film, because I, in fact, I already wrote the the script of my first feature film alpha win that you quoted it's yeah. about my childhood in a, an old uh, traditional neighborhood in tunisia i said no I, I must make a film to make a testimony about uh, the the passion the love i had for my <laughs> my fellow uh, mm -hmm. filmmakers and i am in a position to do that so i have to do it because nobody else could, would do it so I started from that time to film interviews from filmmakers in any place I could go when I find African filmmakers. And I was lucky enough that, uh, uh, again, I was not an outside observer, an outsider. I was not, yeah. you know, foreign observers, like an eth ethnograph coming. Yeah. So you African, yes, well, what's your point of view about cinema? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> no, I was, I was truly one of them. So I decided to make a film which at the same time, will keep their, their, uh, their talk, their voice. And since I was really a brother, they, they took to me in a very French and direct way. Uh, yeah. 
not like they would talk to somebody who uh, will uh, patronize, uh, pa they pa patronize them or something like that. Yeah. But it took me a long time, Rico. It took me 10 years, in fact. Yes. Because I have no means. So yeah. every time I have some money, I buy the, the 16 millimeter film and I made my interview and then I waited for another festival. And then if I went to Cannes, there was somebody there. And after 10 years, I said, wow, uh, in 1963, for me, the start of African cinema with a short film by Sam Ben Usman, Borom Saret, which is for me a short film, but a masterpiece. And now I must finish this film in 83. So it will be 20 years and I call it 20 years of African cinema. Yeah, but I must complete my statement by something. Since I, I consider myself as, as a filmmaker, a creator, I wanted that the film Camera d'Afrique was at the same time, not only a panorama, you know, a, a very distance panorama. I want the people to understand the evolution of African cinema by seeing the clips and I did not put the clips in uh, by chance, you know. Yes. For example, I'm, I would want I don't want to give you all the keys, but one of the key is the figure of the witch doctor. You know, yes. when you the beginning of Camarade Afrique, you'll see that the witch doctor is a crook. He pretend that he will help the lady who brought him a chicken, but he's eating the chicken. He did yeah, not exactly. sacrifice it for God. Then he go to a tree. And he, he pretend that he's calling gods, but unhappily for him, there is a, a guy who <laughs> in the tree and respond to him. So yeah. he became completely, yeah. and then he became ridiculous. So nobody can believe in him anymore. So yeah. it's very clear at that time that the first film of African cinema was made by modernists. People will yeah. say tradition, superstition, no more of this. Now we want a modern approach. You know, in fact, I know that you're very fond of Franz Fanon. Franz yes. Fanon, who is a god for me, because, yes. you know, he lived in Tunis. And yes. uh, because it was, he was supporting Algerian uh, uh, for freedom. And at that time, the front was living in Tunis. He even uh, died in Tunis, in fact. Right. But uh, wait, uh, maybe you, you will cut this after that. But uh, just to tell you the evolution, if you see the beginning of Camera d'Afrique, the witch doctor uh, is seen through a modernist way, that this yeah. guy is a crook. And yeah. we African, we must stop this superstition and become rational, you know, and be independent with the tools of rationality. Yeah. But when you go to the end of the film, there is an evolution. If you see the film, The Chapel by uh, uh, Chisu yeah. from Congo, yeah. Exactly. The witch doctor come and speak to the priest and said, That's not what, true. what is this bullshit about uh, original sin? Right. Uh, you may men die because of original sin. In this earth, there is a beginning and the end. So th that's the animal did <laughs> the original sin too. And the most important, the last clip, the last clip is from uh, uh, Finier by Suleiman Sissé from Mali, the wind. In this yeah. clip, you have a similar scene of the, the guy speaking to the tree. But you know, in the first clip at the beginning of the film, there was no God, nobody answered, only a, a jo a make, making jokes. But at the end of Camera d'Afrique, you realize that the tree answers. Yeah. So there is an African spirituality. We must not deny it because the West said it is only superstition. We must include that and include African spirituality and not deny it. You know, so the witch doctor who was a crook at the beginning of the film, African filmmakers realized at the end, like, you know, uh, uh, like Fanon, that they have to include the heritage. You know, uh, very quickly, the three steps uh, of the colonized intellectual by Franz Fanon in Wretched of the Earth. You know, yeah. he said that the colonized intellectual first step is the assimilation. He wants to become like the colonizer, you know, he wants to, to, and he despises his language and his culture. He doesn't speak anymore, only English or French. But then he realized that he has, has been crooked by colonizers that yeah. Yeah. they will never consider him as equal. <laughs> it will always be second class yeah. citizen. Then the second step is the, the reject of the West 
and what Fanon called blind return to the sources, to, 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 the, to the basics, including the negative aspect of tradition. For example, the negative aspect of tradition is against women, is is, is you know, is the system of the dory, all the, the, and the third step is synthesis, keeping what we may use from the West uh, experience. For example, a, a method of approach, methodology, but not keep not cutting the roots with what is still alive in African culture. And uh, Fanon is a genius because he said, you must not uh, uh, confound folklore, culture with folklore. Folklore yeah, right. is the frozen part of the African culture. Is when people, uh, you know, they do a dance, they don't know any anymore what the, the dance uh, means. <laughs> right, because right. Uh, the, the, the older generation knew that this dance was to ask, I uh, don't know, rain from the gods. Or, but when you dance only for tourists in Kenya or elsewhere, so this is not culture, this is folklore. This is right. doing dance without knowing why, why you're dancing. But there are a lot of uh, aspects which are still alive until now. And this you must include in your films. This, the, 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 the culture is still alive. So very modestly, I hope that the audience by seeing the clips, not only as illustration of what African filmmakers did, but even, even if I don't explain what I explained to you, they feel that there is a slight change of their approach from a modernist approach, re rejecting the bad aspect of tradition and at the end, a real evolution considering that African spirituality is very important and must not be rejected, must be included in their way of expression, so in African cinema. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea for Fanon and also that's shown in, in the clips is that what we're really in pursuit of is the understanding and expression of humanity because it's humanity that's been clipped that makes people resort to other means, superstition or uh, status or caste, you know, what we're looking for is something that allows people to express that humanity, which is itself the objective of us being here. I'm going to uh, go right to the, the third thing that I had asked you on this, because you mentioned uh, 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 Sembain's film, Barom Sare, this idea of authenticity, because it also picks up on what you've been saying about how you felt when you were able to go and meet these filmmakers and also see what it was that they were up to and let them be willing to bring you in and not treat you as an ethno uh, ethnologist or something like that. So in this question, what I was asking about is the question of authenticity, because I think that um, that's you know important to the themes of the film and in that narrative, in that short narrative, narrative of uh, of Sam Baines, he's kind of illustrating that. Um, and I, the the question it precisely is: Please comment on how Sam Baines' deep familiarity and understanding of the lived experience of Sen of Senegalese Africans is so essential to the authenticity of what we see in that clip, and how its portrayal differs from what we had been seeing in terms of this uh, diversionary Hollywood fair. Be in other words, that his position as a member of that culture and his, uh, his position also as an artist made it possible for him to bring to us what we saw. And, and that, that's how that film comes to be the classic that it is. I wanted you to comment on that, how that authenticity um, is the objective and also how it, it, it is that Fanon himself is the, the person who can bring it. I mean, it's similar, I just want to say, it's similar to the way that your film, Alpha Wing, really talks about a real situation. You know, like when you do your film about the boy in the terraces, it's really letting us be there. And it's letting us understand that this is not fake. This is not an outside view. This is, this is real. And so I'm thinking that I'm seeing that and that's the reason for your choice in, uh, you know, putting that in your film. Please comment. Yeah, uh, I think uh, authenticity in uh, Borom Saret comes from the fact that Semben is an autodidact. 
So it, it does not belong to the bourgeoisie or to this educated uh, class uh, that uh, uh, was quoted by Fanon when he said the, the colonized intellectual. He was not a colonized intellectual because he was a fisherman, he was a mechanic. He, he, he went out of school very young, you know, in, uh, in high school. And then he, he, he works uh, so many things. And as you know, he works in France, in Marseille, as a docker in the port mm -hmm. uh, with heavy <laughs> weights too. And from that comes his first novel as a writer, which is Black Docker. So it, his first novel started from an experience that he experienced himself. I mean, it's, it's hard to be more authentic than uh, coming from your own experience. And as you know, uh, Sam Ben, after uh, writing uh, many, many books, he realized that these books couldn't reach his people because his books were written in French and the people in Senegal, uh, the majority was illiterate in French. So he said, I'm writing for my people. The people don't understand what I'm telling them. That's why after more than four, uh, he was uh, aged, after uh, reaching the, his 40th year, he decided to learn cinema because cinema could speak to the illiterate and the books did couldn't. And uh, when you see, I went to Moscow and learned cinema there. And the main thing in Borom Saret, and he knows people like this guy who has a cart. He lived with them. He knows what they think. And most of them, he understand. He understood that his duty was to give to this class, to these people, the opportunity to, to, to make their voice heard. And it's not for the choice of the form of Borom Saret and also Black Girl is the voice of the voice of of the main character allow us for the first time to hear what's come from within an African man. In, in the films by the colonials, it was just, you know, the appearance, but you never hear them, you never hear their thoughts and in their these two films, Borom Saret and uh, Black Girl, it's not the people talking. It is what they have in their mind. The voice mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. give us their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And it was for the first time we have from within <laughs> an African man, an African uh, girl, what they think and uh, uh, the situation where they are caught, uh, what is their reaction? So even from their we realize that Borom Saret is in fact a denunciation of the fact that it's a fake independence, that the independence of uh, the French speaking countries, as you know, contrary to Algeria, there was no uh, fight, uh, uh, there was no war. Uh, France decided to give independence to uh, this part of Africa if they have their money controlled by the central bank in France. I mean, with an economical control. And in fact, the film tell us that, you know, the local bourgeoisie took the place of the French colonialist and the injustice stay the same for the poor people. And if he cross the border between the neighborhood of the poor and the go to neighborhoods of the rich bourgeoisie, well, they take his, uh, his way of working, his cart. And what he say, he said, these people who learn to, 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 to read, they only learn to lie. You know? <laughs> I mean, this is the new bourgeoisie. And you see that he have his medal. So it means that this guy, he, he was in the French army. He gave his blood for the liberation of Europe because the, the Senegalese uh, uh, soldiers were used in Europe against the Nazis. And so the, the policeman put his, his foot on the medal so this guy gave his blood, he have no reward, and the, the, the injustice of colonialism re is replaced by the local injustice. So this is very courageous because it's from the first film saying we are not free. Well, you, we are supposed to be free because we are politically independent, but no, it is a new form of colonialism and the poor class is still dominated, you know? And what is very interesting in the film, 
that he's not at the second level uh, when we speak about Franz Fanon, you know, uh, blind uh, uh, adoration of, of tradition, because we see that there is a man who is praising the ancestors of the main character to, to take money from him, you know, he's, he's like uh, the, the jester in the court saying that your ancestors were great. So yeah. say, you know, tradition is exploiting you as well. You're exploited by tradition, you're exploited by the new bourgeoisie, and uh, who will help you? Your wife. The woman is the one who goes out and said, I will find a way to, to feed us. You know, this is an incredible film. You know, it's very short, but yeah. in this you have everything. So yeah. uh, it's very, uh, fr from this uh, choice with the lack of means, he expressed his anger and his, uh, you know, his, uh, the need of dignity and the respect uh, that is, is missing. And uh, it's said through cinema. It's not uh, said with the speech. It's not said, no, this is what I admire this film. And so this is authentic because he knows exactly what he's talking about. He knows that this guy, the main character, you know, when he see the, the uh, he entered and the rich neighborhood, he said, oh, my ancestors protect me, my gods protect me. So even you even feel his feelings that he's referring to his uh, cultural inherited uh, heritage and all this is completely denied <laughs> by the new bourgeoisie uh, and with the guardians who are the, the cops. The cops are here to <laughs> defend this yeah. new bourgeoisie by oppressing the people and taking their uh, their way of, uh, of, of living. So uh, it, it's really a gift for us to have uh, African cinema starting with this kind of film, because after that, of course, uh, films are so different. You, you may have, after that, you have some films who are only, let's say, political, uh, uh, sorry, poetical uh, dreams. Uh, uh, but we didn't, African cinema didn't start with this yeah. various possibilities of cinema. It started with the real vital thing. Yes, really. and, uh, yeah. and this is, you, you can find this in uh, Black Girl. Black Girl is, uh, is even, Black Girl I think is more addressed, I think Borom Saret is addressed to the African first. And I think Black Girl is more a reaction addressed to the white. Well, let me ask you now about Black yeah. Girl because yeah. to me that I, I did want to you to kind of hone in on that because what I got and what really moved me is this idea, one that's very important to phenomenon theory, of Black subjectivity because for the most part, that idea of closing off humanity to a people and othering people has everything to do with the failure to recognize subjectivity for other people. And so in this film, again, this, uh, the way that Fanon is using realism, but also the way that he's using this lack of dialogue and just doing this inner conversation to really get this thing across, it, it really goes to the, you know, the Fanonian issue of alienation and the idea of shutting off subjectivity as, as the problem. And so now we see it in full bloom and in such a, an emotional way. So I, I, I was wondering if that's what, what, you know, the film is like, uh, what, an hour plus, but the clip that you selected, I wanted you to talk specifically about whether or not it had to do with that question of forestalling Black subjectivity. Yeah, yes, of course. I. In, I think that uh, uh, what is uh, the film is showing us uh, the the deny of humanity uh, from the white <laughs> that the, even uh, in France we had chosification. Uh, you 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 are not a human. You are a, uh, a thing. You know you are a thing. And in the film there is very clear when you know they have a dinner and yeah. one of the guests said, oh. Uh, could I kiss you? I never kissed a, a black girl, you know, like, <laughs> and this is so strong that you see uh, that this, this deny of humanity, this girl is not a human. She's not, she's here like, like a robot to, to, to do things. And the voice of 
give us the contrary, that this person have a subjectivity, have uh, a point of view, and have the dignity to say, then I will not take care of the children anymore because I, I, I didn't come here for money. Mm. But I think the strongest thing in Black Girl is the end of the film. Very often the end gives us the key of the, the director point of view. At the end, the white master, after the death, the suicide of the black girl in France, he come back to Senegal and he bring the unique thing that she kept fr from Senegal and put in her room, it is the African mask. Yeah. You know? The African mask, he give to the family after the death, the, the mask, and then one little brother of the girl put the mask on his head and then the, the, the white guy is frightened. <laughs> he's frightened. He's, he, he realizes his ignorance. He realizes that all this culture, he denied, he ignored all this African culture symbolized by this mask. And he's afraid of it as something which is frightening because it, it doesn't know what it is, it's alien. And this is splendid to see the new generation, you know, the little boy, running after the white guy with the mask and the guy said oh <laughs> i'm afraid uh, i didn't realize that there was a culture i didn't realize that there was humanity i didn't realize that this girl was uh, uh, inherited of all this huge you know yeah. culture and i just treated her as a robot you know and the, the end is is really uh, it, it's 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 great i mean you know it's very few things yeah. and this this is a great, uh, I, I, I really, had, this what what is a, a great artist. This is a, a real filmmaker, you know, not- And the film still it, whole, they still- Using the image, using the cinema to make us feel so yeah. complex and so deep things without making a demonstration like I'm doing now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the films have legs because those films still resonate in terms of the kind of, you know, Black Lives Matter, all of that, they still resonate right now. The next thing I was going to ask you, sort of the first question that I had kind of works with the fourth or um, actually the fifth question. So it's this idea that when you get to meet all these filmmakers and you want to bring to us this history of 20 years of, of African cinema, of, of sub-Saharan African yeah. cinema, because you know that most of us don't know of it <clears throat> and it's really blown your mind. And so now you're ready to now share it. And, and then you end up uh, noticing that so many of the filmmakers are Francophone filmmakers. And so this next question that I was asking is that one of the things that in your question or the narrator's question in, in Camera d'Afrique, you know, who are these filmmakers? How, how these people took so little and did so much and that the countries themselves that they came from were unsupportive. And so they had to find other sources. And one of some of the sources that they found <clears throat> were uh, Europeans, you know, who helped. Like you, 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 the, the film actually points out uh, Georges uh, Sadou, uh, the French journalist and critic who promoted African filmmakers. And it also, uh, and, and Sadou had, had been quoted as saying and talk, bringing up the question, and you mentioned him earlier, uh, bringing up the question of uh, Jean Rouge in, in terms of how uh, he was so instrumental in giving black Africans a voice on the international screens. So the question specifically was, I wanted you to discuss the importance of the influence and support of Frenchmen like Sadoul and Rouche in opening a path for these early uh, African filmmakers. And, and it was a two part. And the next part was looking back, to what extent do you believe that Rouche's influence helped to define who these filmmakers are answering the question of the film, who they are aesthetically and axiologically? If that makes sense. I, I, I sincerely think that uh, uh, neither Sadul or Rush opened any path for African cinema. Okay. This is complete propaganda. This is not true, <laughs> not true at all. <laughs> in fact, you know, all start from something. You saw in Camera d'Afrique that the majority of uh, filmmakers, the pioneers are from French speaking countries, right. not from English speaking countries. But this, in fact, you have to understand that the colonization 
by of Africa, by French, by England, English and Portuguese was different. Why was it different? The approach was different. You know why? Because, for example, England didn't do the revolution on 1789. You know, French did in 1789 a revolution who said all men are equals. <laughs> There's no uh, aristocracy. There is no. And, you know, the vice of the French Revolution still existing is liberté, égalité, fraternité, which means liberty, equality, brotherhood. So the main contradiction when France became a colonialist <laughs> country, when they invaded Africa and dominated Africans, how could you say that you are praising equality and brotherhood when you are dominating people? So to justify colonization, the French colonization have to invent the fact that they are not only coming for minerals or to exploit people. They came to bring civilization. They came to help this uh, underdeveloped people to reach culture, to reach civilization. And because of this contradiction, they started financing financing <laughs> African, uh, including African filmmakers, to say, no, we are supporting the local expression. We are not, you know, uh, here to exploit their uh, mineral resources. And because of that, even after independence, especially the independence, as I said, was given. They, are not, they were not conquered by, by war. So in the French system, we will continue to help the expression of African artists to, uh, to, to show that uh, our revolution uh, uh, pretending that brotherhood and uh, equality uh, is still true uh, because we are still financing these people, you know. But in fact, it was a chance for African cinema because cinema is very costly. You know, to be a painter, you need only uh, some color and, uh, <laughs> you know, a frame. Yeah. To be a writer, you need the pen and you need the white paper. But to make a film, you, have, you need a lot of money to pay the crew, to pay the decor, to make them eat, to pay the actors. But at the same time, this costly art is also the most efficient in terms of communication uh, with the masses. More than books, as I said, uh, Sam Ben realized that, that writing books, he couldn't reach his people. But by making films, even the illiterate could understand a story in images. The, the a visual story is accessible to any. And because when you decide that after colonization, you will use cinema to express from within all the realities of Africa, could be political reality or social realities or even poetical realities, why not? Cultural realities, you need money and you need a sponsor. And as you said, the African government didn't give a damn about helping these bohemians <laughs> yes. uh, making films. But thanks God, uh, we had friends who was uh, here to help. But since England did not do the 1789 revolution, they don't care about giving money to the English speaking <laughs> to make films. Mm -hmm. That's why in English speaking Africa, they developed mainly documentary, you know, in Kenya and Tanzania. And you find documentaries, but very few features. And uh, the features came very late. At the time, uh, that's why in Camera d'Afrique, you find only one clip, which is Ola Balogun from Nigeria, yeah. Ajani Ogun. And this clip do not belong directly to the expression cinema, which is uh, defended by the French speaking, which is using cinema for expression of identity, of dignity, of reality. It was an entertainment, as you saw. It's, it's an adaptation from, you know, the, the Yoruba theater is mainly entertaining and musical. So it's yeah. part of musical. So to answer your question, Jean Rouge did not help at all African cinema. You know, to be brutal, uh, he's an ethnographer, he's a sincere guy, you know. In, in fact, Jean Rouge is the second step. You know, first step is colonialism denying any humanity and any culture to this undeveloped people who need uh, the West to, to, to learn <laughs> the way of thinking and talking. But 
ethnography is a little step to say, wow, these people have a culture. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the colonists denied this culture, but ethnograph said, oh, they have a culture. Okay, it's a primitive one, <laughs> but there is one anyway. So mm -hmm. let's uh, study this to see that these uh, undeveloped people, they have a cosmogony, they have a metaphysical point of view on the making of the world, and uh, they have uh, also their tradition who could express something which is different from the West. And because of that, ethnography is considering uh, these people like an inferior culture with these primitive things, but it's better than colonialism. You know, it's a little better. It's, ethnography is better than colonial. Colonial, they, they are not humans <laughs> at all. They are here to, to bear uh, the, 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 the white men on their... On their but ethnographic said, look, these guys, you know, you go to the Dogon in Mali, they have their own cosmogony, they have their own, oh, very, very interesting. And look at this, uh, you know, uh, these statues, it's art, you know, it's, it's art, which is different way. And even Picasso, as you know, was uh, influenced by the, the, uh, the African mask, and he, he, he quit uh, realist painting to make a, a painting like African mask from different, uh, you know, uh, uh, different point of view on the same, uh, on the same size. Yeah. But you know what, we, Sam Ben, which is my master, and uh, yeah. uh, he said, Jean Rouge is filming African like insects. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like ants, yeah. you know, he, he's yeah. studying <laughs> the way of ants function. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so this is very different from talking from within, like we, like we said together in Borom Saret and Black Girl. Yeah. This is an external, uh, what's so called scientific observation of how these strange people make, uh, you know, uh, voodoo uh, dance or something and revile of the dead. Uh, and uh, oh, it's very peculiar, it's interesting. <laughs> but of course, they are still inferior. Yeah. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. we are, so uh, I think Sadul, he would just did his job as a critic saying, uh, well, it's about time that uh, there, is, there, there is also an African cinema. So we have a first step that Rouge is showing us that, that these people have a culture. But, uh, but if, you, if, you, if you, you take attention to, to this position, uh, uh, it's not, Yet, uh, from them, the position to 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 have, uh, let's say, oh no, I, I I remember what I want to say. You know, the big luck of African cinema is that France invented cinephilia. Yeah. You know, yeah, France invented the yeah. fact that Ooh, yeah. a film director is as important as a writer. Yeah, as important as a painter as important as a musician, he's a creator. And the French, they even did this, that for entertainment films. Say, you know, in Le Cahier du Cinéma, they said, if you see Howard Hawks films, there is a personal point of view behind the Westerns and the comedies and uh, the same for Hitchcock. Hitchcock, uh, yeah. there was, he said, look, these are entertainment films, thrillers, but there is an artist behind that uh, with his own point of view. Yeah. So, thanks God, the French who invited this approach of cinema and the fact that a filmmaker must have an artistic point of view was the model for African cinema because it, it was the first uh, people who helped them and give them money. And this, the, the second chance, so the African did not have to make entertainment films uh, and then go to author films and expression films. They started directly <laughs> with expression films. They start directly what, with the essential things, you know, speaking about the essentials. So I, I'll give you another example. If you, the only country in Africa which uh, created the film industry is Egypt. Mm -hmm. Egypt, they started this in the 30s, the beginning of the 30s. Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. that time, Hollywood did not dominate the screens of the world yet. Yeah. Uh, why? Because in the 30s, there was no TV. And you know, until the 50s, a Hollywood film could make 
his money back only from the American market. Yeah. I mean, a film with Elizabeth Taylor or, uh, mm. was, so they, they, they were not imperialist yet. Hollywood was not imperialist yet. Of course, they had their film uh, outside of America, but they were not using that they, like they did uh, after the 60s, CIA and uh, mm -hmm. diplomatic influence mm -hmm. and threatenings <laughs> to make sure that Hollywood continue to dominate the screens. Why? Because the foreign screens be became vital for the economy of Hollywood. I mean, uh, before, a TV, a Hollywood film could regain all his investment and make some benefit. And with the benefit, you make a second film, a third film, a fourth film. But the drama for Hollywood is in the 50s, TV was uh, uh, had a so huge success in America that half of the audience stayed at home and yeah. looked at TV. Yeah. So all this audience didn't bring money anymore to American films. So American films then if they have to invade Europe and to invade all the countries of the world, even by force, yeah. because they, they need the second half of the investment. Yeah. And when you go back to the only African country who made films, Egypt, mm -hmm. in the 30s, Hollywood didn't see any problem for Egyptian to make a film industry or Mexican, uh, Mexican film industry or Turkish film industry or Iranian film industry. All these industries existed with no problem with Hollywood. But in the 60s, it was too late because they needed badly the, the screen of the world. Uh, it was vital for them to have the, the half of the money back. So it was impossible then for African cinema to become an industry. If you look at the Egyptian cinema, they started in the 30s on the model of Hollywood. They made musicals in cabaret with great singers, Om Kaltoum, Farid El Atrash, and they made melodramas and they made thrillers. So it was very hard for an Egyptian inside this entertainment industry to express Egypt, like Sam Ben did for, <laughs> for yeah. Senegal and for Black Africa, because the industry won't let him. They yeah. said, if, if you want an entertainment. So that's why people like Youssef Shaheen, who is the, the greatest yes. uh, uh, filmmaker from Egypt, yeah. you know, he had to make many musicals to make many like that. And then he, he made his own Cairo station, his own personal film, who was a commercial failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the producer said, no more of this. And they turned back to make musicals. You know? mm -hmm. So black African cinema was lucky enough to start from zero, yeah. to start from nothing. There was not an old cinema to fight. There is no entertainment industry who would block you, said, from the beginning, the patrons who are helping you financially was the champions of cinephilia, <laughs> the champions of, of uh, author cinema, of expression cinema. Yeah. This is the greatest luck of African cinema because it started with the real essential films giving voice to an artist to express his own personal vision of his people from within, from the inner thing. And uh, unhappily, the, the government didn't uh, go uh, like uh, we know uh, when we created the, the Pan-African Federation of Filmmakers, the idea was to, to create a solidarity between African nations yeah. and African regions to decolonize screens and to take back the screens and from the screens make films because with no market you cannot make films because uh, as I explained it's too costly. If yeah. you don't have enough screens yeah. you cannot recover your investment. Right. And since the African governments did not respond, we stayed in the patronizing of France. Yeah, okay. And so it's better than nothing, I must say. <laughs> you know, you must, <laughs> you yeah. must, uh, when uh, Sam Ben Usman, uh, when he made his second film, which is uh, The Money Order, Mandabi, yeah, Mandabi, because of the success of, uh, you know, Sadoul wrote about Black Girl and said, ah, oh, yeah. Finally, we waited so long to have uh, African cinema. So the, the, De Gaulle was the president and the Ministry of Culture was a great French writer, Mr. André Malraux, who was also resistance to, uh, against Nazis. So André Malraux, as the Minister of Culture, proposed to Saint Ben, he gave him money to make his second film, Money Order, in, uh, in color. Okay. So, but he said, uh, when the French Minister of Culture gave the money, he said, you have to make the film in French because uh, 
you know, our audience won't understand Wolof. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Ben said, I take the money and make two versions. One yeah. in France, because I have to, to give yeah. it to France, and the other in Wolof, yeah. uh, which is more authentic, as you were <laughs> uh, expressing. But of course, people came to Ben and said, how come you are really an anti-colonialist hero? You, in, in Black Girl, you showed uh, the, yeah. the racism of the colonialist. And yeah. how come you take money from France to make uh, your film? So the, the answer of Ben is very important. He said, I will make films even with the devil's money <laughs> <laughs> at one condition, that the devils don't put his tail. <laughs> 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 no, that's very good. So yeah, that's, that's... And, uh, 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 maybe I will, I will uh, finish this. Mm -hmm. And you know, the turning point for African cinema is the the year 1987. Mm. I wrote a piece about that. That then you you will find it in uh, uh, Black Camera, which is published by Indiana Press, because they asked me to translate a piece I wrote about the two paths of African cinema, Tiaroy by Sam Ben Usman or Yelen by Suleiman Sissé. Mm -hmm. And I will very briefly tell you the, what it is a turning point. All our efforts, uh, I was myself the guy who wrote the Niamey Manifesto of African cinema because Sam Ben said, come, you are like the Egyptian scribe, you know, the, the scribe who worked yeah. in the Pharaoh's time because you speak many languages, you will write <laughs> the synthesis of wh what we, we, we talk about African cinema. And uh, all this effort was to solidarity between African nations to create a market who will be the basis of uh, uh, an industry, of having enough screens to, uh, to recover the money. So in 18, 1987, the film by Sam Ben Usman was called Camp de Tiaroy. Mm -hmm. Camp de Tiaroy is a film about a real historical massacre was made by the French colonist army against uh, the Senegalese troops after World War II, after they gave their blood to liberate France. They dared asking, when they back to Senegal, asking what, what uh, was promised to them. I mean, their uh, military, uh, I don't know, pension, pension. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the crazy general friend said, oh, these savages are <laughs> making yeah. a strike to ask money from them. He sent the troops and they, they fired the people. You know, they are, it was a, a massacre. And Sam Ben made a film on this, but he insisted of not taking the devil's money. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. didn't take a cent from France, uh, the contrary of the other filmmakers, which what they are only mean. So he succeeded to create a co-production between three African countries, Senegal, of course, Algeria, who gave him the uh, director of photography, who gave him the film, and Tunisia, my country, who gave him the post-production development and mix, uh, sound mixing, everything. So the film was only made with African support, with no money from the North, no money from the West. And when he presented this film at Cannes Film Festival, the same reaction that uh, the French Minister of Cooperation had with Black Girl said, whoa, what is this subject? <laughs> <laughs> subject against white racism? Mm, my boy, this is not this kind of thing that we want to help you to do. Maybe do us some poetical lyric <laughs> things, yeah, but not yeah. this. So the film was rejected by Cannes Film Festival, but it was taken by the Italian Venice Film Festival. We didn't have a colonial past <laughs> in Senegal. Yeah, but look how how uh, the same year the other way of African cinema was represented by Yelen by Suleiman Sissé, yeah. which is the film who completely was accorded to the standards of uh, art film festivals in the world. You know, uh, uh, the model of African cinema we want you to do. I mean, no political, very poetical. Related to your tradition, related to, uh, thanks God, Suleiman Sissé is a great artist. So the film <laughs> is really beautiful. And there, there is also a, uh, a link to African spirituality. But when you see this film is 100% financed by France. I mean, France give money to a film who could enter in the cinephilia standards, you know, following me. Mm -hmm. If it mm -hmm. enter in the cinephilia standards, I mean, be 
awarded in Cannes Film Festival, it's okay. But if the film is too offensive against the past of French colonialism, no, thanks. We don't, we, we are not taking it. So from this, this year, 87, we really hoped, we fought, you know, uh, since 1970 uh, to have this kind of co-production South-South. Mm -hmm. And this is the year we lost the battle. This is the year where it was clear, mm. then the last attempt to add Sam Ben, and it's not a, a, a chance because Sam Ben is our master, <laughs> mm -hmm. and was rejected. And from then started financing films, RT films. I mean, mm -hmm. songs are made by great artists, thanks God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same thing, for example, when you had in America, Coppola and Scorsese helping Kurosawa in Japan, saying he's a great artist. Mm -hmm. He belongs to the history of uh, the seventh art, and now we have no means to make. So we'll finance, give him money to make Ran, for example. Mm -hmm. So it is the same cinephilia attitude that we help artists to express themselves. But the hidden thing is if he doesn't <laughs> mm -hmm. insult us. In fact, <laughs> historically, <laughs> This was possible in the 70s and the 80s. You know why? Yeah. Because then there was a sense of guiltiness among the, uh, the French intellectuals that they colonized Africa, that they, were, they exploited these people. So people insulting France were welcome yeah. <laughs> at that time. Yeah, yeah. In the 70s and 80s said, oh, this is these people that we oppressed. Now they talk and we said how much they oppressed. But after that, they said, OK, enough. Now, enough of denouncing us, us and making us guilty. The, the other generation didn't feel any more guilty about the third world, said no. Uh, and since cinephilia, cinephilia I must praise it. Why? Why, Rico? Cinephilia is a very democratic religion. Cinephilia is a religion. I mean, a real film buff mm -hmm. sincerely thinks that from the smallest village of Burkina Faso mm -hmm. could be born the equal of Kurosawa. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he really, and he's waiting for that. Mm -hmm. You know, he's even searching. This is a unique chance because of the cinephilia, a guy like Suleiman Sisse or a guy like uh, 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 Mahamat uh, Saleh Haroun, uh, mm -hmm. they are welcome immediately to enter in the cinephilia field at the condition that their film has arty enough. I mean, they have an artistic level. Yeah. So it's, it's a non-written message that don't do politics. If you criticize, criticize your own, yeah. your own <laughs> system, yeah. Yeah. your own country. Yeah. But please do it aesthetically. Then you'll have a chance to enter in the court <laughs> and yeah. to enter. And yeah. from that time, if you see the film in Cannes Film Festival, they are all aesthetic films. Yeah. It doesn't. I'm not. I'm not criticizing, huh, Rico. Let's be no. let's precise. <laughs> yeah. I admire a film like Helen. Really, he's a he's a real a great director. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. If, if you see Suleiman films he made before, you see, for example, Bara. Bara mm -hmm. is really struggle of class. Yeah. You know, the corrupted the head of the factory. The yeah. young engineer wanted to yeah. to yeah. defend the workers, and he's killed. You know, <laughs> and the workers uh, revolt against the, the the boss. This is, you know, from his Marxist approach coming back from Moscow. You know, coming back from Moscow, he still had this training to denounce uh, the engines. If you see the film he made after that, which is uh, Finier, Finier, the wind, yeah, the revolt of students against military oppression, military dictatorship. So it's still. Uh, in the present of Africa, with the real problem of his own country, and it's his duty to 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 make a film about that. And he was clever enough. I know very well Suleiman because I made the the subtitles of uh, Finier, wow. <laughs> okay. yeah. the French subtitles. And he said, if I showed the film in Mali before, he had been censored, banned. But since the film was shown in Cannes. And, and was praised there, they didn't dare cut the film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even, he said, political guy said, you know, 
uh, thanks God you showed it before in France. Yeah. So now we have a, a reason not to cut the film. Say he brought prestige to the to the country. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, like uh, Sam Ben said, you have to 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 navigate in the cactus path between all the contradiction, the local political contradiction, and the paternalistic position <laughs> of the West to make film even with the devil's money. But now if you see the present of African cinema, because we failed to make this solidarity, this economical solidarity, which the last film was Count de Tiaroy. After that, there are few countries which continue to make co-production. For Burkina Faso is the first one because they co-produced Sara Unia by Medhondo. They co-produced the uh, Mola De by Sam Ben Usman. Well, Tunisia co-produced also uh, after Sam Ben Kandutiaro. Uh, they co-produced the, uh, the film of uh, uh, Flora Gomez from Guinea-Bissau, yeah. which is uh, called uh, uh, The Tree of Blood. Uh, I will remember the title. Mm. And uh, Morocco co-produced also it because they, they offered post-production to a lot of African sub-Saharan films. But all these were very few, uh, what say, remembrance of, the, <laughs> of what we aim to do. And since the African governments did not do this common market that we are dreaming of, yeah. we stayed in the not south-south, but north-south axis, Okay. And the North said, okay, we let you do some offensive critic, critic film against the West in the beginning. It was normal, but now enough. Uh, I, I will give you the right key of this. In the film Finier, you have the main film is the revolt of the students against the military dictatorship. But there was the, the scene I quoted before, the old grandfather, because his grandson is arrested, is in prison, he go to the tree and he talks to the God. He said, help me to free my grandson. And this is a great film because you know the God, the answer, but they said, don't count on us. We exist, right. count on yourself. That's right. Count on yourself, count on your, your wisdom and your strength. So this is very important, you know, it's li like the third, uh, step of Fanon, synthesis, you know, yeah. African spirituality exists, but yeah. it does not uh, allow you to, to count on only on gods. You have also to be a man and to, to fight as a man uh, with, with, <laughs> with the other men. Yeah. But you know what happened in Cannes? The critics, what they said to, Sam, to Suleiman Sisse, they said, well, a film about the revolt of students against the military uh, dictatorship. We had a lot from Latin America, my, my son. We had a lot. We had the Brazilian films. We had Argentine films. This is old fashioned. But the scene where the old man talked to the gods, this is typically African. Yeah. This is what you must develop. We love that. What yeah. is original for us as a cinephile. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not uh, said directly, but in the in conscience of the filmmaker, he said, well, I have no market at home. You have no screens. The screens are dominated by foreign uh, Western films. The only markets I have are festivals, thanks to cinephilia. Yeah. Uh, so these people are telling me indirectly, let's forget politics <laughs> and uh, give us some dream, give us some trip so we escape in your wonderful African magic, you know? Yeah. And without, it's not conscient. When you see the films in Cannes, they are more and more, you know, erratic, aesthetic, you know? Yeah. They are beautiful because the guys are talented. But, yeah. Yeah. and another point, maybe it's I'm too long. When you take Abderrahman Sisako, Sisako is uh, mm -hmm. one of the greatest film director of Africa now. Right. When, made the film uh, which is called Harry Makono. Harry Makono is the film about himself trying to leave Africa and staying in Mauritania. Uh, it, uh, Harry Makono, Waiting for Happiness, it's in English. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. 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 This film was put in a, a section with a non-competitive section 
mm -hmm. Imkan, un certain regard. Mm -hmm. uh, but official selection in a big room, mm -hmm. lot of critics. Mm -hmm. The year after he became himself president of the jury of this section. But after that, because the film was very aesthetic and uh, very beautiful and deep at the same time, it's, it's wonderful. It's a great artist. After that, he made a film called Bamako, yeah. the court where we have in an African court, people denouncing the, the International Monetary Fund uh, and his politics towards Africa, the, the, uh, denouncing World Bank and its uh, politics about Africa. Yeah. But this film was not put in competition, oh. was not put in Satraga. I was in Cannes. It was put in a very small theater, which is at the last... <laughs> <laughs> the last floor of the festival and we had to enter in this why because it did not correspond to the new standards yeah. if you are african and you want to be adopted by cinephilia you must enter in the aesthetic standards and not bother us with your criticism of world economical system or world political domination by International Film Fund or World Bank. So after that, uh, maybe he understood the lesson because when you see uh, his last film is with Timbuktu is a great film because you have everything in it. You have at the same times, a very aesthetical form, but also a view about what oppresses the, 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 the West for the moment, you know, jihadism, terrorism and so on. And the, he made a film with all, 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 you know, a global film. Yeah. And this film, of course, uh, he was awarded in France as best French film of the year, not African film, best French film of the year, best uh, French sound, best French editing, best French. <laughs> and uh, this film, again, was entirely financed by France. But I don't want to be a guy who, who spoil. I said, even with the devil's money, yeah, yeah, yeah. African cinema exists, even with the contradiction of trying to be in the accepted, yeah. uh, uh, what do you say, uh, <laughs> yeah, take place it. they gave yeah. to you. So that's why I think if we succeed in, you know, I'm old now. In, in putting this, uh, this struggle again, said, let's count on our, our own forces. Let's not depend of the North at this degree. No, let's yeah. not depend of if the North co-produce, I make the film, it doesn't, I can't. So. Uh, no. Well, the thing about, uh, the thing about you. Contradictory, but my, my position is a position of, Let's let's uh, talk some with some wisdom. This is better than nothing. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. The, the African cinema survive thanks to the the finance from the north, and thanks to cinephilia, they don't interfere that much, you know, because yeah. like uh, Coppola helping Kurosawa, they are waiting from the African to give them a piece of art. Yeah. But thanks, yeah. cinephilia is democratic philosophy. Uh, if it was only profit or business, there yeah. will not be any African cinema. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, all of those points are carefully um, put into Camera d'Afrique. I mean, I'm not, we, we're not going to go into all of them, but I just want to point out a couple of them. I mean, the, the, the conversation between Idoline and uh, Alassane, I mean, it really, to me, points out that contradiction and hypocrisy that you're talking about now. And then you also talk about CIDC, which, you know, had not had, you know, at that time had not come and gone, but now it has. And so it really talks about the obstacles of how we do, how we put our money together and how we continue to do this. And I think that the last conversation for us to have has to do with the question that you ask in the film, which is about what is the future? of African cinema, you, that we got this start, we had this luck, and we had this, the, the auteur, you know, toting French who wanted to help us, and they did help us, but they also gave us that idea of the artist as the engineer but of the art. Frame. 
and, yeah, and all of that is really wonderful. Yeah. But then it, the strings, you know, became more and more apparent as we went along. You, you, all that's in Camera d'Afrique, which is wonderful in various different ways. Sometimes in clips from conferences or conversations like the one with Edeline, it's all there. And so apart from just having the clips, there's also those conversations and awarenesses of those things, but the questions that are being asked. And so in terms of this future, it's interesting what you're saying, this whole idea that, you know, stray away from criticism. Um, and I think that one of the artists, and I'm not sure for better or for worse, but one of the ones that you excerpt a couple of times, you start off with him actually, is Med Hondo. And so this whole idea of, certainly this idea of auteur is there, but also there's this idea of um, this, this critique that he's talking about, um, kind of a strident message, as well as the auteur style, which is his own. And so I'm wondering if you see that as... They're saying that... Wait a minute. I'm getting feedback. But anyway, I'm wondering if you see his film... The next are you are you hearing me? Uh, not as good uh, as as it was. Okay, well, let me just the ask transmission. The yes, the question is is actually the one. But please, uh, put put the question again, if possible. Okay, yeah, the the question is uh, to what extent do you think Soleo, uh, in its strident message and experimental style, portends a global, I call it emancipatory tendency in, in cinema? a tendency that links him to other auteurs like Eisenstein, Solanus, Ro Rocha? That was, that's the question. Yes, well, uh, if you see the search for uh, a new form like Soleil-O and also mainly in Tuki Buki by Gibraltar yes. Mombetti, which is a, a masterpiece, you must link it with the historical period where these films were made because they were made in the 60s and late 60s, exactly at the time when the world new waves emerged. New waves were, were rejecting the mainstream cinema and claiming the, the right to, to talk differently with film, you know? And uh, uh, you know, the luck of African cinema, as I said, is to be born in the 60s. I mean, at that time where Rocha in Brazil created Cinema Novo, then uh, you had also Milos Forman was, uh, uh, the, they called that in Czechoslovakia, uh, Prague Spring Cinema. And of course, uh, in France, Jean-Luc Godard, who uh, created a new, uh, a new form for cinema. And so the, the luck of uh, African cinema is to, you know, to refer to Franz Fanon again. Franz Fanon, he said, after uh, the colonization period, the third world have the duty to create a new man, right. <laughs> a new man who, yeah. uh, and uh, this is also in African cinema, to create a new form, a new way of expression, uh, not, not only complaining about colonialism and what happened, you know, to, to be complaining as a victim. No, proposing something new, something which will be an addition to humanity, an addition to what Seven Earth gave to humanity. And when you see Munamoto, Munamoto is also a way of telling the things differently and adding a new poetry and a new point of view to the cinema of humanity. And this is a, a very important that it started at a time when everything seemed possible, you know? And there was even an audience for that. I mean, if you, if you show now La, La Hora de los Hornos, you won't find a public ready to, yeah. to hear an anti-imperialist speech for so long. Yeah. The audience moved, the yeah. audience wants something else. But at that time, you can be free enough to improvise in Tukibuki from your, your soul, you know, to improvise a really a lyrical way of, uh, of uh, uh, expressing this guy who wants to go out of Africa like, with all his rebel without a cause, and at the end, 
not being able to, 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 to leave Africa you know, after all this uh, teenage and young uh, uh, revolution. This is one of my favorite films, of course. Yeah. And uh, uh, because of that, African cinema experienced it very early, uh, very different uh, paths, you know? You, you have, if you see uh, in Niger, for example, Mustafa Lassan and Jingare Maiga, who worked also in Jean Rouge film, we see it's local melodramas, you know? It's uh, mm -hmm. very, uh, I mean, there is no research of a new uh, form. So mm -hmm. thanks God, because of the new waves, you quoted Rocha and, uh, all these people, they had access to this film and said, we can revolutionize the speech as these guys did. I mean, uh, Rocha is not better than Jibril Diop Mambeti. <laughs> right, right. Or, or, or Dikonge Pipa or, uh, yeah. you know? And uh, I think this is very precious because of that, we can refer to pioneers at, as free creators who were free to invent a new form of cinema starting from Africa and not only uh, the period of weeping about colonization and weeping about uh, denouncing all you know uh, the victimization no we had all together we had <laughs> the and it depends of the personality if you take Jibri Diop Mambi take the Senegal Inside the same country, you have very different ways of doing films, you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. is very different from Sam Ben's approach, you know? And yeah. very different from, uh, let's say, uh, 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 Moussa Touré now, or, or, uh, or the guy who makes Felicity. Uh, 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 you know, the, the young guy who... Uh, Which one? You know, the younger one from Senegal who made uh, uh, Tay. Tay is today, is, uh, and he made uh, Felicity. He shot that in Congo. Alain Gomis. Okay. Alain Gomis. Okay. Yeah. If you see Alain Gomis, you realize that there is still this vein of researching a new language still alive. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. You see. Tay is an incredible film. The guy who knows who is going to die and who cross all the, the city of Dakar. You saw that or not? No, I did not. Yeah. Ah, Tay. So I, I must just uh, make you feel confident that it's not dead. It's not dead. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's the answer I'm looking for. Yeah. So, I mean, all of this um, just kind of emphasizes the importance of Camera d'Afrique. And um, we noted that it was shown first in Cannes, um, I think in uh, 1983. And so now with this new um, HD, uh, you know, print that you're part of class, uh, Cannes Classics 2019. And I wondered how you think that matters. Is that important? If so, why? And, you know, are you, um, you know, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, uh, Camera d'Afrique and Happily was filmed before the end of the dream of CIDC. Uh, CIDC was, yeah. you know, the goal we were dreaming about that uh, yeah. 14 yeah. African countries make a common market yeah. and allow for the first time in history, some African films to go in 14 African countries, like it was the case for Finier, The Wind. It was shown in all these 14 countries, the same for Wend Cooney by Gaston Caboret, all these films. And as uh, and happily, I didn't uh, film the, the, the end for local political reasons, in fact. You know, because in these 14 countries, there were countries with, uh, let's call, uh, a progressist uh, government, you know, uh, like Burkina Faso at that time with Thomas Sankara, yeah. anti-imperialist. Uh, yeah. and the same 14 countries you had Oufouet Bonny, who, who was uh, right. before independence, uh, French de deputy in the French parliament. So he's uh, uh, pro French. And all this uh, uh, mix of con contradictory regime led to the burst of CIDC because uh, uh, 
the progressist one said this uh, could become a neo-colonial uh, network. So it, it was an extreme position, a radical position. Uh, yeah. I think it was a mistake to to cancel this uh, this wonderful uh, network because of political reasons. You know. Mm. Uh, so we realized that the mistake was maybe maybe we, we should have made a cooperative between national societies of cinema and not between political governments. Mm. Because political governments they fight. Yeah. And then they, they blew up the whole thing. If it was only technical, you know, only economical, it would have survived. So this is the missing part in Camera d'Afrique, which is, uh, you know, the, the end uh, of CIDC as the end of the economical struggle. Uh, and uh, also, uh, if it was possible, I would add the two paths, Count de Charoy and Yellen, as the two patterns of African That's cinema, as I did in the paper in the Indiana Press Black Camera. But, uh, and happily, uh, I'm a pessimistic. I don't think that uh, this film could change things only if we show it to African head of states. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. if you find a way, we have find a way to, for example, there is the Francophone Summit, uh, which is uh, in Tunisia, next uh, this year in fact at the end of 2019 2001 where a lot of head of states will come from africa if if by chance we succeed to show them camera d'afrique maybe these people said wow why did we lose this yeah, yeah. <laughs> this opportunity look what was the dream and what happened now we only have films who you know and why this is this could make a miracle because if you take a country like Chad, for example, you know, yeah, yeah. Chad, they, all the Ch film from Chad was were financed by France, mm -hmm. including the the films of Mohammed Saleh Haroun. He made Darat. Yeah, yeah, I do know. Dry that. season was shown in Venice, and the man, a man who shouts, uh, an homme qui crie. Uh, I don't know if what the title in English. Yeah, and the film was shown in Cannes official competition and he won award like Suleiman Sisse in 1987 mm. and then I, I imagine the scene the Chadian head of state calling the director please tell me your secret <laughs> the press never speak about Chad never and because of one film we had 4,000 articles yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> on on Chad thanks to cinema so yeah. my son tell me how could we develop this thing you call cinema, this, <laughs> you know, seventh half? So, uh, Mohammed Saleh Arun, uh, he answered to the head of state, he said, you know, a country like Morocco, they did very well because they did like France, in fact. They did not finance film from their own treasure. They make a part of the, uh, you know, the, the advertisement in television about, uh, I don't know, uh, coffee, sugar, a yeah, part yeah, yeah. Of, of the income of television advertisement go to the National Center of Cinema. Yeah, so yeah. the more you see uh, buy this brand of coffee, the more you have money, more money <laughs> for yeah. cinema. Yeah. So the, the head of state said, well, but in Chad, the television is very poor. I said, well, there is another way. You know, smartphones are very popular in all Africa mm -hmm. and they are a huge income. Mm -hmm. So if you make a tax on that, we'll have money to, to, yeah. to make films. So they had said, okay, all right, all right, son, we'll do that. Yeah. And then Chad, which is one of the poorest countries in Africa, made a law that uh, I think 5% of uh, the mobile telephone income will yeah. go to cinema. That's amazing. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. But, but with this money, so Mohamed Sararun made another film called Gri Gri. And this film was shown in Cannes Film Festival in competition again, because you know, they have this author politic. They encourage uh, uh, the, uh, uh, if a guy had already uh, a film competition, they, they showed the, the other film competition. Okay. And you know, Rico, I was so proud in Cannes to be in this huge theater and the film start with the Republic of Chad presents. Okay, all right. Yeah. Because money came from 
yeah. not from the French, but he came yeah. from the <laughs> from yeah. Africa. Yeah. Yeah. No. But I don't know what happened. I don't want. It was uh, after that it stopped, it, and uh, the money was only used for this the same director film, but. Uh, the other directors, I think, didn't have access to, to make other films after that. He stopped it. So we always have little hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some hope government that. will realize that African cinema has also a prestige weapon for them. Yeah. Because of that, they decide to help. And then, uh, unhappily, it doesn't continue. So. I think if I succeed to show Camera d'Afrique to all the head of states <laughs> of the African summit, we will, after that, uh, make, uh, you know, please make a common market again. This yeah. is important for your prestige. <laughs> yeah. I hope that happens. So, Farid, this has yeah. been an amazing conversation. Um, and we are just so happy that we could, at the African Film Festival, facilitated and also just as a part of our virtual festival, get Camera d'Afrique back to our audiences in, in New York and virtually in the world. Yeah, I hope, I hope it will find a, a distributor in the States because uh, my feature film I distributed in the States uh, thanks to Kino Lorber. You know, yeah. They distribute Halfawin, Boy of the Terraces, they distribute Summer in La Goulette and the last one, Zizou. But maybe if they know that Camera d'Afrique was shown in the prestigious African Film Festival, maybe they could, uh, or another distributor, take it for, you know, the universities, African Studies Department, and could yeah. be very useful, I think. Could yeah. be very useful because as, as you heard, I'm a pragmatic person. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. uh, I, I hope that even a small path in favor of African cinema given by this film, now what students or professor is an important path. It's an important step. Yeah, yeah my films are shown, which are mostly for education uh, markets are Third World Newsreel and uh, Cinema Guild. You know, those are the distributors. Well, I, I, I really, you know, hope, I really hope that- Narrative uh, films, you know? Rico, yes. Uh, I was just saying that Kino is mostly narrative films. Oh, yeah. But um, the, the Camera d'Afrique has a, it does have a, um, an audience. So I, I, I'm confident, as you said, we, we are hopeful. I'm confident that it will find a distributor here if that's what we're looking for. That's good. And I also hope that you are successful in showing yeah. Camera d'Afrique to these heads of state and that I we- For free. Yeah, for, for free. free. And that we also <laughs> can, um, can revive the CIDC. So this is all good. Thank you so much, Farid. Book there. We are. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you so much. Well, you so I'm much. really very happy that New York African Film Festival is showing the film. Thanks to the effort of Mahen Bonetti. You know, you quoted that uh, I tried to make uh, African Film and Audiovisual Fund. And Mahen Bonetti, the head of Afri New York African Film Festival, was in it. She was part of the board. So, uh, so yes. she helped a lot uh, and happily didn't succeed, yeah. as usual. <laughs> but we tried. So my really, I'm very proud of the film in New York. I, yeah. I, I, you know, uh, Rico, my, my hope that if people who see Camera d'Afrique realize the vital artistic right. and human right. uh, importance right. of African cinema, that they will, because of this film, try to know more. It's unmistakable, unmistakable. Farid Bougdir, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>